Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. This week, we're still continuing the story of Avraham, but we're picking up with generations, okay? That's actually the name of this uh, parsha, is Toldot, which means generations. We're switching our focus now. We're, we're not just focusing on Avraham. Um, we're not even really just focusing on uh, Yitzhak. But we are kind of following the lineage now. We're going to switch over from Yitzhak to his sons, which was Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esav. Okay. Now, the point of this is obviously, you know, covenants and you're following the line of the promises and the things that were given. But we learn in the process that uh, even a family who was in covenant with Yahweh does not, uh, it doesn't spare them having challenges. Let's put it that way. We all have challenges in our life personally. We all have things we need to overcome uh, day to day in our walk. Uh, no family is perfect. We have to learn how to grow within a family and learn how to uh, dwell with one another and work with one another and help bring out the best in one another. We have to learn how to do that. And um, that, that that's a day-by-day -day process. Okay. And what we see in this story is that there are two brothers specifically who were at war with each other. And you may think that's an exaggeration. Literally, it's not. Uh, from the womb, they were at war with one another. And uh, we, we see that uh, Rukha, she went and, and, and cried out to Yahweh saying, what's going on? And he says, there are two nations in your womb. It's not just saying you have twins, okay? You could have just said you're going to have twins and that'd be the end of it. Like, oh, okay, well, that explains it, right? No, it says there are two nations in your womb. And so there's, there's two groupings of people and they're just not getting along, okay? And what we see is throughout the history of their life, as you follow their relationship, even to this day, they don't get along. So there's some things that we have to learn here and, and why and what's happened and uh, how these things can relate to us. And I want to specifically bring about an issue of blessing. Okay. Uh, blessing can exist where there is still turmoil. Okay. And, and it's like kind of like peace when we talk about having peace. Peace does not mean the absence of, of problems or the absence of, of, uh, of, of turmoil. Peace means you have a peace even in the midst of whatever else is going on. Okay. So a blessing can still be a blessing with no matter what else is going on around you or what else is going on in the world, Yahweh can still declare his blessing to you. And there are some things in blessings that have come to pass. There are some things that are coming to pass and there are some things that are yet to come to pass. But I think the bottom line of that is when Yahweh makes a blessing to something, we need to hold on to that and have hope in that and believe that he meant what he said. Now, we see this example as well from the patriarchs. The patriarchs, they would bless the next generation. They would give a blessing to the next generation when, it, it, when they felt they were uh, coming time to the end of their life. They would give a blessing to the next generation. One of these would be a birthright, a blessing that would follow to uh, ideally the first uh, firstborn son. And this wasn't just a blessing. And so you may have heard this also called the double portion blessing, and that's what it was. It was a double portion of everything. Why? Because the birthright wasn't just a, a, an addition of, of things. It was a responsibility. It was accountability uh, to the rest of the family, and it was responsibility to the family, saying that uh, they are going to take care of of the rest of the family. They're going to handle the family business. They're going to take care of mom. They're going to make sure that uh, uh, the brothers and the family, whatever is, is running as it should, these are things that are going to happen. Okay. So this is given to someone with a good business sense, a good business knowledge, and one who cares about the family and is going to try to see the best for everyone in the family to try to pass on to the next generation. Okay, and that's the idea when you receive a blessing. It's not just for you, it's to, it's to bring into the next generation as well. So when we talk about a blessing of biblical proportions, so to speak, uh, what do we think of when we, when we hear the word blessing? A lot of us uh, in America, you know, you say, oh, someone's blessed, and you think they have stuff. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have something that you think is, is awesome, therefore they are blessed. And that's really not blessing, okay? Um, blessing can involve things. It can involve money. It can involve items. It can involve uh, people and situations. But the blessing from Yahweh is a covenant 
blessing. It's passed on from generation to generation to generation, and it's it's uh, blessings that follow obedience and serving Yahweh and teaching the next generations about living with Yahweh and, and what his word says and his heart towards you. And that's how this blessing flows from one to the next to the next. Now we come to this situation where Isaac wants to bless his son and he wants to bless Esau. And uh, he says, you know, oh, oh I, I can't see, I'm getting old and, and, and I'm thinking I'm going to die soon. And uh, go, go, go and, and get some of the, the, the meat of the field that I like, you know, venison, right? Go get some of the meat of the field that I like and cook it up so that I can bless you before I die. Now, interesting because we see that um, he lives many, many years after this, many, many years later down the road, he's still alive. So, I mean, was he over exaggerating or did he really believe he was at the end of his, at the end of his life and got better? We, we don't know. Okay. Um, regardless, he's, he, this is the situation he wants to tell his son. Now we see how he favors Esav, but we see that Rivka favors Yaakov. Now this causes further problems. Okay. Could her favoritism be from the uh, from the idea that when she prayed to Yahweh, Yahweh said that the older will serve the younger, right? Uh, possibly, you know, she favored him because she knew the promise that was given toward him. Uh, maybe did she tell Yitzhak about it? We don't know, really. Uh, but the way that they are acting towards one another kind of alludes to the idea that she didn't. Okay, um, but we do know that that Yitzhak loved Esau, and the, the way the scripture says it is because he did eat of his venison. And Rebecca, Rivka, loves uh, Jacob, Yaakov. Now, uh, Yitzhak loved, it's, it's Vayehav Esav, because he didn't eat of his innocent, but Rivka, Ohevet, loves Yaakov. It's not just loved uh, Jacob, it's loves, okay? It's a present tense verb, whereas uh, in relationship to Yitzhak, this is, a, this is a, a, a past tense. He loved him because of... See, there's conditions on that, but there's really no conditions put on there with uh, with Rivka loving Jacob. So she loves him, and there's nothing, no explanation of why. She just loves him. Okay. Now these two men are, are completely different. Without getting into a lot of the details, if you know the story, you know the story. Okay, uh, Esau was a man of the field. He was he was a, a, a mighty hunter, and there's a lot of midrash regarding that as well. And uh, and Jacob was a man of the tent. Okay, he was he was he was a simple man. He was a man of the tent, which implies um, study, thought, and 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 learning. Okay, so we learn in this what each of them sees and views as important in life. Okay, matter of fact, we we see that you can know a lot about a person by what he feels is important. Uh, we we learn in this parsha that uh, Esav it says he despised his birthright. So that was something that, I mean, that's, that's God given, God instituted, and it's made to take care of him and the family, right? Um, we, we learn a lot about that. What we see here is that Esau starts to trade a, a situation in now for something that was spiritual, really. He trades a temporary situation for something that is lasting, Okay. And we have to be careful about that as well. I mean, in life, you're going to be in situations. You're going to be in hard times. And, and sometimes we can't see beyond the situation that we're in. It's okay. It happens. That's, that's the way life gets sometimes. Sometimes we can't see beyond the situation. It's right in front of us. We're in the midst of it. And we can't pull back and, and see beyond that. That's why we have uh, others around to help us at times, right? But here, Esav, he, he goes out in the field, and apparently he, he must not have caught anything because he comes back and he's like, I'm famished. I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. And Jacob is, is cooking this lentil stew, and he says, uh, pour some of that stuff down my mouth or, or, or I'm going to die, right? So Jacob says, sell me your birthright. Give me your birthright and I'll give it to you. And is that wrong to ask for something like that? That seems kind of severe, right? Quite possibly, yeah. But at the same time, does Jacob know his brother? Yeah. Is, is Jacob saying, if this guy gets a birthright, I'm going to get nothing and my family's going to be out. And when I have a wife and kids, we're not going to get anything. He's definitely not going to take care of mom, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a lot to consider in this. But uh, let's take a quick look at the scripture. Genesis 25, 29. 
Genesis 25, 29 starts off. It says, One day when Jacob had cooked some stew, Esau came in from the open country, the field, and he was exhausted. And he says to Yaakov, Please let me gulp down some of that red stuff. That red stuff. I'm exhausted. And this is why he's called Edom, which means red. Yaakov answered first, Some of your rights as the firstborn. He says, Look, I'm about to die, said Esau. What use to me are my rights of the firstborn? So he traded his current situation and a, a quick solution here now to something that was lasting eternal and worth more than than one meal. I mean, if he was that hungry, I mean, I'm sure he could have made something, right? Um, no, no, it's, he, he, he despised it anyway. He, he didn't want the responsibility. He was just, no, this is it. So is the birthright the only blessing that we're looking at here? No. Because there are other blessings that are given in Scripture. There's a lot of things that involve blessing. And not every child has a firstborn birthright, the uh, firstborn blessing. But we, we do read in Scripture where many of the patriarchs, they blessed all of their sons before they, before they died, right? Even Jacob, before he dies, he blesses all the tribes. Joseph, before he dies, he blesses his son and his brothers, right? Um, all of this is going in, okay? Uh, uh, Moses, before he dies, he blesses the tribes. So, so there is a blessing that's beyond birthright. Okay, and, and, and these two can work together, though, because there's a blessing that helps equip the birthright to, be, to uh, do what it's supposed to do. All right, let's take a look at Genesis 17, verse 18. And Abraham says to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God says, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Itzhak. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him. You see that? I, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Itzhak, whom Sarah shall bear to you this time next year. So there's a difference between a birthright blessing and just a, and a blessing, but the two can uh, exist around one another, okay? So the rights of the first one was passed down as a heritage, not just an inheritance. It's not just, a, just something for you. It's for you, but it's to help uh, go to the generations that are beyond you. And the name of this portion is generations, right? Did Esau care about the next generation? Did he care about who, his descendants and who's going to follow him? He was a very selfish man. He saw the, the birthright as meaningless, right? I mean, look at that in Genesis 25, 34. So Jacob gave Esau the bread, the pottage of lentils, and, and check out how this reads. He ate, he drank, he rose up and went his way. Thus, he despised his birthright. The word is bizarre, as, is to despise, which means to disesteem to be contemptible and a, and a vile person, to despise. So here it says that he despised his birthright. And the way it reads, I mean, and this, 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 this it's very succinct, you know, just very, da, 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 right? And, and, and so this is how this has all happened. It's, uh, it's uh, I don't want to say emotionless because there was obviously emotion involved, but it just, just very blunt, all right, and this is this is just the kind of guy he was, and he despised his birthright, and he just give me this and give me this and give me this and eat it, and I'm gone. Okay, so that's the kind of guy that he was, and it says that he despised his birthright. He didn't consider or live for greater things or spiritual things. He was all about serving himself and uh, getting things for him and and how it how it affected him right now. Okay, kind of like a, a little child that never grew up, right? Just just remaining. Uh, it's all about me, and it wasn't, right? Okay, let's keep going. Proverbs 19, 16 says, He that keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he that despises his ways shall die. So his ways, whose ways? Well, it could be he who despises his own ways. It doesn't really say that. I kind of like to read this as he, he who despises his ways. See, because uh, we are to follow Yahweh in all of his ways, and we are not to despise his ways. We are to walk humbly with him, right? Uh, look at Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 14. Keep pursuing shalom with everyone and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and contaminates many, and that no one is sexually immoral or godless that's profane like Esau, who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as the firstborn. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to obtain his father's blessing, he was rejected. Indeed, even though he sought it with tears, his change of heart was to no avail. 
So Esav was called godless or profane. And profane means you are careless with something that is holy or you see nothing as holy. There is nothing in, in your idea or frame of mind that says anything is holy. It doesn't, nothing else matters to you. It's just about you and what you can get. Nothing is holy. And, and, or if something is holy, you treat it as something profane. You don't care that it's holy. Okay, now what do we learn about Scripture? It says, don't be godless or profane like Esau. Don't treat something that is holy as though it is common, as though it is nothing. And in the scriptures, we are told, we are learned to discern the differences between clean and clean and holy and common, right? Why? So that we don't profane Yahweh's name. So that we learn to walk in ways that are honorable to him. So that we learn what is clean and what is holy, right? In Leviticus 10, verse 10 and 11, speaking to Aaron, he says, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean. And you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that Yahweh has spoken to them by Moshe. And this is something that was to be done throughout the history of Israel, not just a one-time event. It's not just uh, Aaron was supposed to teach uh, uh, the people there what, what Yahweh spoke to Moses, and it was just for them. No, this was for uh, them and their descendants. And this was an issue of covenant. Because they are in covenant, they're going to learn to walk in his ways. And this is why he tells us how to walk in his ways. If we look forward to Ezekiel, we see in Ezekiel twenty two twenty six where it says, Your priests have done violence to my law, and they have profaned the holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. See, that's how they profane the holy things. They didn't make a distinction between what's holy and common. If you don't know what's holy, then you're not going to treat it as holy. Okay? It may be your heart to not transgress. But if you don't know that something was set apart, you could transgress it and not even be aware of it. Okay? So the priests knew. They didn't teach it. They didn't care. Okay, so it says they've made no distinction between the holy and the common, neither have they taught the difference between unclean and clean, and they have disregarded my Sabbath, so that I am profaned among them. For princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain, and her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions, divining lies for them, saying, Thus says the Lord God, when Yahweh has not spoken. So see that? They they made no differentiation between the clean and clean and the holy common, which allowed them to step in and say, you know, Yahweh says this, and, and Yahweh did not say. Okay, they were prophesying in his name and saying things he did not say. And, and not going there, but I'm kind of thinking of, of Yeshua when he says, there were people who would come before him, and they say, didn't I do these things in your name? And he says, depart from me, I didn't know you. See, this is the kind of thing we're looking at. Ezekiel 44, verses 23 and 24, speaking of the sons of Zadok, it says, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. In a dispute, they shall act as judges, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all my appointed feasts, and they shall keep my Shabbats holy. Okay, this was again to all Israel, all the people who were in covenant, all the people who were called by his name. Of course, we know in the history of Israel, they did not do so. They, they turned away from Yahweh, they served idols, and they went their own way. And, and through the prophets, they were continually being called to repent, to return to the Lord their God, to hear his voice, and to walk in his ways, right? We see in Hoshea, uh, chapter 8, verse, eight verse, starting in verse 8, it says, Israel is swallowed up. Now they shall be among the Gentiles, that's nations, as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Because Ephraim has made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. It means uh, uh, they're either altars for idolatry or they're putting unclean things on it or, or however that is. They were misusing uh, an, an altar for Yahweh. It says, I have written to him great things of my Torah, but they were counted as strange. That word strange is profane. So Yahweh is saying, I've, I've shown them great things in my Torah, but they said that's profane. They've twisted uh, what, what, what Yahweh told us. He said, keep it holy. We say it's not holy. He says, this is not holy. And we're like, oh, that's good. I want, I want that. Okay. So again, this is learning uh, how, to, how to look at things through Yahweh's eyes, not ours. Okay. So what do we learn regarding the situation? And again, we know the story. 
Um, uh, Rivka says says to her son uh, Yaakov, he s- says, so Esau's being sent away. Let's try to beat him to the punch, essentially. Uh, Yaakov doesn't want to do it. He says, what if they find out? And she says, let that be my problem, essentially. And she says, just do what I tell you to do. And could she have acted because she knew that the, the, a blessing was supposed to be on him from the womb? Possibly. We don't know. Um, it was deceptive, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. However, we look at this. It's taught that Yitzhak tricks his father to steal the birthright. But what actually happens is Esau tries to get back what he gave away. Okay, there was a, there, he says, he says uh, sell me your birthright. And he despised it, so he didn't care. Um, he says, well, I, I don't want it. What good is it to me anyway? So here, you can have it. And then, and then later, he wants it. You know, when it means something to him, now he wants it. Okay, now the question really is, is, is the blessing that was given to Jacob when, uh, uh, when, he, when he was blessed by his father, was the blessing the birthright or was it the blessing? And, and you take a look at it. Well, aren't they the same thing? No, a birthright is a blessing. But was he just generally blessing him or was he passing on the birthright to him? Okay, see, a little different. Let's take a look at this really quick. In Genesis 27, 28. It says, so may God give you dew from heaven, the richness of the earth, grain and wine in abundance. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. May you be Lord over your kinsmen. Let your mother's descendants bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now look at Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. May my teaching fall like rain. May my speech condense like dew. The light rain on blades of grass or showers on growing plants. For I will proclaim the name of Adonai. Come declare the greatness of our God. See, so there's something about this. And the dew of the earth means um, you know, that that's water. I mean, it didn't really rain, right? Not much. So the dew, they counted on that for abundance. So the dew is, is, is an abundance and it's a gift from heaven, right? It's, it helps grow the crops, helps you to collect water or doing all these things, right? So he gives him this, he gives him this blessing and then uh, Yaakov goes away and then Asaph comes in and now he wants his blessing and his blessing is gone. His father said, I already blessed. And, and, and of course, ancient Near East, the way everything was, once you, the blessing was given, you can't revoke it. You can't go back on your word. You can't go back on, on your blessing. You can't go back on what you've done, right? So what happens here in Genesis 27, 34, Esau heard his father's words. He burst into a loud, bitter sobbing. And he says, father, bless me too, he begged. And, and see, so now he wants what he was giving away. He wants, he, he said this had no value for me before, but now it has value and now I want it, right? So Yitzhak was deceived by his desire of what Esau could do for him. He was deceived because of what he could receive from him. And there, and he tried to bless. And, they, and did he suspect something was up? Yeah, because you know how he said, "Okay, come near. Okay, I smell him. All right, let me feel you. Let me feel you. The voice isn't right, but and, and let me smell the food. Let me taste it. Yeah, that tastes right. Uh, so I, I must be, you know, right. And it didn't happen that way. Okay, but Esav, he he desired now something that he couldn't have, and he he tried to undermine. Um, what what was be, what was being given to Jacob? Now look at this: a blessing and a birthright. We're talking about two different things. Could Isaac have purpose to have something to provide for each son? Consider that for a moment. Could he have said, "I have I have a blessing for you, and I have a blessing for you"? And think about your own children. If you have children, right? Um, each of your children they have different personalities, they have different desires, they have different uh, goals in life, different things, and and you want the best for them, right? So you want to bless them, but you want to bless them according to something that means something to the family and them. Okay, so could could uh, Itzhak have reserved blessing for both sons? Quite possibly. Okay, and and now there's a, a different scenario that's kind of unfolding here. Okay, so what happens? So Isaac prepared two sets of blessings, one for Esau and one for Jacob, and, and he blessed Esau. You know, in Genesis 27, uh, uh, verses 28 and 29, he blessed Esau with gifts that he felt would be appropriate to Esau, like wealth and power. 
You know, may God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, abundance of grain and new wine. That's wealth, okay? Uh, and, and you know how it goes, wealth and power go hand in hand, right? So if you have wealth, you got power. If you got power, you'll get wealth, right? So this was a mindset that's even going out here today, right? So this is, this is a blessing that would mean something to him. Is that the birthright, though? Not really. Um, and he continues, he says, May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. That's power. Uh, but these are not covenantal blessings that were passed from generation to generation to generation. Okay. And again, these are by uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. All right. So let's look at this. What is the covenantal blessing? Covenantal blessings that God had given Abraham and Yitzhak were completely different. They were about children and a land. It was this blessing that Isaac later gave Jacob before he left home. Remember, he had to leave home now because his brothers now wants to kill him. He's mad. He wants to kill him. So he gets sent away. Jacob gets sent away. Okay, uh, hey, why don't you go find a bride and uh, start your family, do all this stuff, get this blessing, roll in, kick it off. And in the meantime, give your brother time to cool down. And uh, when he doesn't want to kill you anymore, we'll send for you. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Um, thing is, they never sent for him. All right. Just kind of saying that. But um, what happens here now is now he's getting ready to go off in exile, essentially. He's being exiled from home uh, in a place where he's never been and he doesn't know what's going on, but he's going off into, in a land of exile to find a bride. And before he goes, what does Itzhak do? He blesses him. See that? He Now here's another blessing. Okay. So look, he says, may God Almighty bless you make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. That's, that's children. And that's, that's going out. And so may he give you and your descendants the blessing given to Abraham. See that now he's invoking Yahweh and invoking Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner and the, and the land God gave to Abraham. Again, that is about the land. This is a blessing that uh, Itzhak had intended for Yaakov all along. Okay, this was this was a blessing passed on, invoking the name of Yahweh, given from Abraham, given to Abraham, from Abraham to uh, Yitzhak, from Yitzhak to Yaakov. This is a covenantal blessing now that we're looking at. And we see this in Genesis 25, 5. It says that Abraham gave everything he owned to Yitzhak, but to the sons of the concubines, he made grants while he was still living and sent them off to the east of the land of Kittim, away from Yitzhak, his son. So when the time came, he gave everything he had to Yitzhak, but to his other children, he gave stuff. He gave gifts. He gave some some things, okay? Which means he gave him an inheritance. He took care of them, but he says he gave everything he owned to Yitzhak. If he gave everything he owned to Yitzhak, what would he have left over to give to anybody? See, so the, de- so the idea is what's the definition of everything? See, that's the covenantal blessing, okay? And so he's passing on covenant and the blessing that goes with it. Now, we see another show of covenant and blessing when we see these two sons starting to come back together. Um, it's a, a, a long story, right? And so uh, uh, he, uh, uh, Yitzhak gives the blessing to Yaakov. Yaakov goes off, uh, goes off to the land. He works for Levan for a while. A lot of stuff happens there. He, he starts to come back as a family. He says, this is time for me to go back home. And he starts to go back. Uh, he comes across the two camps, and he's worried about going to war with his brother. He wants to be peaceful, all these things going back together. How does all this work? Okay, so when they came back together, though the intent of Esav was to kill his brother, Yaakov gave the blessing back. He Did he give his birthright away? No, but he did give the blessing back to Esav. He said, you want to kill me over a blessing? I'm going to return it to you. This is what was given to you in the first place. Uh, this is what you say you have right to. Here it is. Okay, Um, that is what the sheep, the cattle, the other livestock represented heaven's due and earth's richness. The fact that Jacob bowed down seven times to him was was the way of fulfilling these words. May your the the sons of your mother bow down to you. That's that's power. And Jacob gave the blessing back because he said, please accept the blessing, Birkati, the, the blessing that was brought to you for God has been gracious to me and 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 I and everything that I have. And he's he's given me all that I need. The idea we have here is this. You learn a great lesson here. If your brother's being blessed, rejoice with them. Don't envy their blessing. 
be content with your blessing. Be, be, be happy that, that Yahweh has a blessing for you, but he has a blessing for your brother too. He has a blessing for those around you as well. He has a blessing for all of us children. Don't envy your brother's blessing or, or further don't be like, well, how come he's getting that blessing? I want that blessing. I don't want him to have it, right? Be, bl be, be blessed with the blessing you have. That means receive it. That means be content with it. That means walk in it. And who knows what's down the road, right? So don't seek out your brother's blessing. Walk in your own. Exodus 20 verse 17 says, Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I'm speaking in need or I've learned whatever situation to be content. Romans 12.15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We see in Romans 12, verse 16 to 18, it says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. See that? He didn't say uh, because they're giving you what you want or you're getting out of the relationship what you want. No, he says with as much as it is, is up to you, as much as you can help it, live peaceably with all. See, not everybody wants peace. Not everybody wants to walk uh, hand in hand with Yahweh. But we do. So we must learn to be content with where Yahweh has us walk with him. And who knows what's going to happen and what he's going to bring later. In the meantime, if Yahweh is blessing your brother or sister, whomever, rejoice with them. Be happy for them and help them celebrate. And that way we can see uh, the goodness of Yah in our midst. Because who knows? You know, if you get a blessing, aren't you happy? And, and aren't you wanting to share that too? You know? So again, um, let's learn to walk in, in the calling that Yahweh has given us and learn to be joyful in that and be content in that. And, and who knows where that's going to lead, right? Okay, so that's all I have for you this week, guys. Um, I pray these these blessings, uh, these blessings, I hope these teachings, I hope they are a blessing. I hope they, they do challenge you and I hope they encourage you. And uh, the idea is that we learn to be more like him, that we learn to change. It's not just about knowledge. It's about uh, learning to apply the word and, and knowing about it and about him so that we can show him here in this world, right? So if this has been a blessing to you, please consider making a donation to help keep us going, to help keep us uh, able to make these videos and help putting them out there. And uh, on whatever avenue that you watch, whatever social media platform, wherever that is, uh, please like, subscribe, share, whatever you need to do there, guys. Help us get the word out and hope, help us to show life and to show the heart of Yahweh in the midst of everything, okay? So until next time, uh, blessings to you all. May you be blessed and... Shalom.